I was released uh, the second time. And uh, when I got out, um, <clears throat> I went through a series of things. I went through uh, my involvement in, with the American Indian Movement. Uh, I uh, started out, uh, I order, helped to organize the League of Indigenous Sovereign Nations, or LISTEN was the acronym. I started that organization. Uh, I uh, worked very heavily to stop the relocation of the, 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 the Navajo people, Diné people from Big Mountain. Uh, in 1983, I, mean, I think you were there, Alan, uh, 83, we put on that big, huge conference at the United Nations week down there, when we put that in. Disarmament week, there was 2,000 people we brought to the United Nations to an end to the rise of the nuclear escalation as a threat to world, uh, world survival. We were calling for disarmament worldwide. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, consistent, non-stop political activity. But then I want to take you all the way to British Columbia and Canada. I moved to Canada, and while I was up there, I was involved. I, was, I became involved in the Sundance ceremony. I, I started doing Sundance. And uh, I, sun, I Sundance with uh, the Piscataway Indian people, a uh, chief by the name of Billy Tayak. You guys know Billy Tayak, right? Chief Tayak and his son, Mark Tayak. So we all went out to South Dakota and began Sundancing out there. My son, Nicosa, came and Sundance with us for four years. <clears throat> Matter of fact, there's a picture of us buried with him in his grave right now as Sundancers in our regalia. <clears throat> I Sundance for 16 years, and uh, the first one was out in South Dakota, then we did it out here in the East Coast, at the, in Maryland, outside of Maryland. Now, um, <clears throat> when I was up, I still had <clears throat> two years to finish up my commitment for the last four years. And so uh, I moved up, I was living up in uh, Hinton, Alberta, and I was looking for a place to Sundance. And I met a, a man by the name of Wolverine, and he's a Suswap elder from, uh, from the town of Chase. But he lives on the Adams Lake Reserve, and I guess outside that town. Well, to make a long story short, we uh, we worked with a guy. Started with, we, I met him, and we started working uh, with a with a guy who was a, a professor. He was also had a doctorate degree in international and conventional law. His name was Dr. Bruce Clark. Now we were studying the title, the whole question of title and unsurrendered Indian land in up at Gustafsson Lake. And when we found out there had been no treaties made beyond the treaty frontier of British Columbia, so 95% of British Columbia completely unsurrendered Indian land and still title according to the 1763 Royal Proclamation rests in the hands of the indigenous populations and is validated by the 1704 Queen Anne's Court, as well as the 1532 Papal Bulls of Limus Diaz, and as well certified by Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, which says all rights are that the, the protect, which guarantees the protections, and it guarantees and enshrines the protections of Aboriginal rights, including those relative to the 1763. Now, I also see, I also know that within the Confederation, the Confederacy. We have the same 1763 with Great Britain. We have the we have the uh, uh, the covenant chain with France. We have we have many different treaties with international treaties the two world welcome. We have many treaties that get validates the right of one nation sovereignty and the other nations respecting each other's sovereignty. And so subsequently, this particular guy brings all this law together in a law that could be challenged in the courts. Try to take it to the courts 43 times. Of course, wouldn't hear it, but they didn't want to validate. Yet they still established these illegal, bogus treaty treaty making processes called treaty, you know, uh, treaty making over there in British Columbia. Well, what they're trying to do is just get the people, various people that are working with the governments, to sell out the rights of the people's lands and the rights of their continued existence within those lands. <clears throat> Again, basically for resources. Now I'm not going to spend a long time there, except to say that we ended up in a 79-day standoff with them, and it was an armed standoff in defense of them coming in to try to kill us and to remove us from this piece of land up there and further north up in theirs. Uh, eventually, uh, it was a major military operation, including the use of the Joint Two Task Force Two. They came up there trying to snipe people out, trying to kill people out, but 
miraculously, nobody died. And in the long run, though we didn't win there, what happened is there was one of the fellows that was up there was a guy by the name of O.J. Pitawanaquat, and he was an Ojibwe from up this way over here. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, Croak, Croker Lake over there in Canada. And he was with us up there, and he came down after he got went to court. He got two years for a gun possession of a rifle, a hunting rifle. And he skipped and went down. He went down to, uh, down to uh, the United States. He sought asylum down there. And the judge that heard his case when he went there, he was asking for sanctuary, the judge granted him an asylum, and in her decision, she said that he had the right to defend that land up at the South Sea Lake in the same way that the Palestinians have the right to defend their land against Israeli aggression. Woo. So, this is now written by us. So, by seriously, we made our position the whole question of title. Now, I know it's hot in here, and I know there's a lot more to say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of breeze through it so we can get to a Q&A on this 40th anniversary of Attica. We can take a break. Uh, I have an autobiography back there if you want to look at it and help buy it and buy it and see the whole story, all the definitive actions that we took. Please, please do. That'll help me get back to where I'm going all the way back to Canada, all the way on the other side of the country, on the Pacific Ocean. But here's the next thing that happened in the line of the resistance. And this is talking about the line of resistance. Because once you're involved in this resistance, you either eventually throw yourself over that wheel by collaborating with the state and selling out, or you just keep going with nothing in your pocket and the will of the people to help you and to bring people into the forces of collectively moving against the same corrupt regimes that are denying our rights to be the free, sovereign, independent people that we are. That's who we are. We have to continue to fight. I can't get off of that wheel. I can't, no matter what I want to do. And yet I have to continue to assess and analyze all of my actions and activities. <coughs> so then, on March the 17th, 2009, <clears throat> we heard that George W. Bush was coming to Calgary, Alberta. Yes, and he was going to, for the first time, come out of retirement of the two stolen elections that he and the neoconservative regimes and his administration stole those elections for eight years and totally destroyed American civil liberties and the rights of people internationally on their bogus war on terror. Bogus wars on terror. Because the invasion into Iraq and Afghanistan, Pakistan, and now we're talking looking at as an extension with Obama in the third administration of the Bush, we're looking at Libya, Syria, and we're looking at the potential for the invasion against Iran, Russia, China, and a world nuclear third world war. Is it amazing? If we don't intervene, if we don't intervene, it's coming. This is serious to me. I can't get stuck on any one little politic here, little politic there. The progression is, intervention so that my children, John Jr. or a star, Jay Thunder, Rainbow Rose, my children, my grandchildren, so that my kids, your kids, have a world free from a nuclear holocaust. These knuckleheads are taking us to the brink of self-destruction. Global destruction. We have a job to intervene. We must intervene. We don't have a choice. Because if you don't do nothing, that's called complicity. In what? In state-sponsored terrorism? No, it's complicity in your own annihilation. I'm not waiting for that. I want to give my children a chance to live. Even if I die in the process, it don't matter. I'm old, I'm ugly, I'm ready to go. Don't matter. But while I'm doing it, I gotta have a purpose. I gotta have a purpose. Because I wanna see a world of peace, tranquility, love, understanding, abundance for all. Who has the right to deny us these basic human rights? 
necessities. No one has the right to do that. And we must let them know that they don't have the right to do that. And we must look to Wall Street, their bankers and the lawyers, and say, your number is up. Because that's who the politicians are. <laughs> which just so happens to be my sister Cynthia McKinney's birthday. And she, she addressed this issue to a delegation of 1,800 delegates in Kuala Lumpur trying to indict the Bush administration for war crimes for illegally doctoring up documents that basically said that, <laughs> that, that Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were no security threats to the U.S. They didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And subsequently, after 9-11, they decided to invade Iraq. They decided to torture thousands of Muslim people, women. They decided to execute them mercenary style, kick down their doors and kill their families right in front of their children, rape and murder them. All because we're exporting democracy to these countries. Well, I tell you what. You better never try to import it to my house because I'm going out. That's the way I'm going out. You bring it to me, I'm going to serve it right back to you. Because there's no fear here. There's no fear here. Don't try bringing it to me. Believe me. What they've done to those people, the tortures, the imprisonment to these so-called rendition sites, these so-called black sites, Legalized countries that working with the United States, Syria, Israel, Egypt, all allowing this, the, this unbridled aggression and madness by the United States post 9-11 to torture people. And subsequently, today, 96 people are dead as a result of that torture. And the Bush administration, then, who was a currently accused war criminal, today, in his own autobiography, be it a self-admitted torture said he would do it again. I submit to you here tonight the torture that the Bush, Cheney, Wolfowitz, Douglas White, every single body in the neoconservative regime of the Bush administration from the project of the new, new American century and their plan orchestrated, their orchestrated plan to invade these countries to seize their oil, not, in, not export democracy, but to import the oil of these countries. Just like they want the oil on Indian lands for the last 520 years. They want our uranium. They want our water. They want our coal. They want our gas. They want everything. They want the resources of the world. That's all we're looking at. And they want to be rich. They want to live in mansions. They want to have big Cadillacs. They want to flee the goddamn Bentwoods. They want it all. They want to go to the big operas. They want to go in there. They want the rich want to have it all while we sit here and sweat with nickels and dimes and talk about how we can change that so that we can have a stitch of the clothing that is on their backs and put it on our children. Yeah, maybe it sounds a little rhetorical. It really is. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. Does anybody see it getting better? If so, tell me how. Tell me how you see it getting better. I think the only way it gets better is when we make it better. That's the only way. So now George Bush comes into town. Now, now listen, now again, I'm getting a little older, a little wiser, and I'm trying to use a little more peaceful tactics, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get in good with the anti-war movement, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to learn how to do the kumbaya and all that other <laughs> stuff. Right? And I'm, trying, I'm, I'm, and I'm not really cool. I'm just making light up. But I'm also, I'm just, I'm studying resistance around me. And I'm studying all the issues. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm studying. And I'm trying to respect what I see around me. And I'm trying to incorporate it. <clears throat> I don't want to be seen as a loud, angry person. You know, I want to see as a maturing elder, looking at things uh, and trying to make some constructive, uh, strategic decisions to make change in a good way. So now, but and yet still fearless. Because as I see the progression of this unbridled butchery, 
of the Bush regime, now in the, or the Obama regime, with the drone killings in, 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 in Pakistan, with, the, with the, the NATO invasion into Libya, it's only getting worse. Our prophecies, the prophecies that Degana Weider told us about this day was coming, and we're sitting right here at the brink of the prophecies of the peacemaker. We're sitting right at the time when this is going to happen, and this is what's happening right now. We have to intervene. We have to stop it before it destroys the world. So I say, well, okay, well, I'm not going to take no guns and try to arrest George Bush because that'll get me killed right away. But I do try to warn George Bush on paper with the law because the lawgivers are here. The lawgivers are here. The return. The lawgivers are here to return the great law. The great law is going to be, it's, it's going to be re-ignited. The great law is going to be understood. The true, we live, some of us live by the great law. We live by the law for our survival. Our prophet brought us a great law, which is good for the people. There is good law. There's just bad bad criminal people that govern. But we have to reinstitute the law. We were told this time was going to come. So in doing so, we see George Bush lying, illegal invasions, bogus wars. So now we say, okay, well, am I going to ask a criminal to indict a criminal? A criminal court to indict a criminal? No, I can't, because those institutions do not serve the people. Those institutions serve the rich. Just like when we said by Canadian law you're not allowed into Canada. Right? The Canadians say under the Immigration and Refugee Act you don't belong in Canada because you are a currently accused, now self-confessed war criminal. You confess to torture, you confess, and uh, subsequently you confess to the murders of those that died in this horrendous torture in violation of Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions on torture. So, so we say to you, I'm not going to say, you know what, there's nobody going to try them, even in a Nuremberg trial, a Nuremberg type trial. Matter of fact, eventually I will try in my case against George Bush to establish what I called, or my friend and colleague, the Professor Anthony Hall from Lethbridge University, we call it the Calvary Principles, just like the Nuremberg Principles. And to indict George Bush, Dick Cheney and his whole administration for war crimes. And so I told the cops with a bag of papers, with Blackwater mercenaries in, in camouflage gears and balaclavas and fully automatic weapons from the top of the roof, at the, looking at the Tele, Tele Convention Center, 1,500 people lined up to pay $400 a pop to listen to this knucklehead named George Bush say what? Say what? All they wanted to do was rub shoulders because Calgary seems to become the hub of the oil barons in industry and it's absolutely known today as Texas North. There's more Texans in Calgary than there are Albertans. And that's really scary. But at that moment with 700 of us, I said, hey, I told the cops, and you can Google split in the sky, arrest Bush, and see the actual deal. Google it. And I told him, I says, you're a war criminal. He's a war criminal. You're either going to arrest him, according to Canadian law, or if you don't, I'm going to use a concept known by Professor, Professor Francis Boyle from the University of Chicago. It's called civil resistance as opposed to civil disobedience. What I'm saying, in the absence of you exercising the right to arrest these people as known, as known war criminals, if you don't do it and you're, you're protecting the interests of the rich, I'm going to break your line and I'm going over there to arrest them myself. Now where I go from that, if I get there, I don't know where I'm taking them, but I'm going for them. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went, was first one, I went up to right over here. And I look, I, I says, uh, I'm going through it. He grabs my arm, I threw his arm over like that. Then I turned around and came back over here and went right through and broke the line. 
But halfway to the door, I had ten to five guys on me, smash my face into the ground, break my glasses, chip a bone in my cheek, knock me down, and then I realized I didn't get shot. Because <sighs> they were, I took them so fast, I took them by surprise. And that's how it has to be sometimes. So, but I also jockeyed myself in front of Pamela Wallen, who happens to be a senator from Canada, <coughs> right, with that whole line, 1,400 people. So if they shoot me, <laughs> right, that magic bullet is going to shoot, is going to hit 1,400 people in line. <laughs> like the same bullet that took Kennedy out. <laughs> the magic bullet theory, anybody ever hear about that? Mm -hmm. Of course you have. Some of us older folks know about it. Younger folks have probably heard about it. But in any event, they didn't shoot me. They handcuffed me, picked me up. <clears throat> when I stood up, I, was, I caught my breath and I said, Arrest Bush, not me. Arrest Bush, not me. Right as they're carrying me off to the paddy wagon. I go to Calvary Jail. Oh, they beat me up real good. Oh, they need me in my family area. And as they're beating me, I go, oh, come on, man, come on, come on, do a little bit more of that. Oh, but that doesn't hurt. Come on, man, get a little harder, a little harder. But I'm psychologically letting them know I'm not afraid. I'm feeling very good about this moment. Bring it up. When that door opened up, a superior, stop doing what you're doing right now. You know why? Because Ramsey Clark, my lawyer, my appeals lawyer, Ramsey Clark was on the phone, where is my client right now? They didn't know who you were, who, they didn't know who I was. And all of a sudden, Ramsey Clark told him, the former U.S. Attorney General, and then that was it. <clears throat> I spent the night in jail, I got charged. I'm gonna be real short here. I was facing $30 fine and 10 days community service. I said, well, wait a minute, guys, I already, I hope, I thought I was doing my community service. <laughs> <laughs> But that wasn't what they were saying. What they were saying, <laughs> they were trying to get me to admit that I was wrong, that I had obstructed justice. I said, oh, whoa, 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 let's get some clarity. I didn't obstruct justice. I was instructing the need for justice, and you obstructed justice, so I instructed justice. Does that make sense to you, Judge? Well, Mr. Bonker, I, I truly believe that you will believe that you believe. And I don't need money. We're not here to discuss uh, the, the evils of George Bush administration. I said, oh, so you concur it was evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't say that. Well, you're on record there, sir, Your Honor. <laughs> I'm not that same guy you tried to put away for a submarine sandwich years ago. I'm way past that today. So I say, no, I says, no, I want a jury trial. Because in that jury trial, I'm going to establish the thing, a legal concept known as mens rea. I'm going to tell this court on record that uh, why I did it. Why didn't I do it? I'm going to say I had believed I had the right to do what I did because of X, Y, and Z. And they gave me my trial. <clears throat> we went for a whole year. Eventually, I went to court. Uh, Cynthia McKinney was supposed to come and testify at my trial after she had already told 1,800 delegates in Malaysia and then headed to Britain when she told the, de the, the, the delegates in Malaysia that she was coming to a trial of a man who courageously attempted to arrest George Bush by the name of Splitting the Sky. And she was going to testify on my behalf. When she got to Canada, she was banned. She was delayed. So she couldn't testify. Then Ramsey, came, Ramsey Clark came up as a character witness. And Ramsey got up there, and geez, I was humbled. And Ramsey said, uh, well, he said, Your Honor, I just want you to know that I've known John Bunkor Hill for many, many years. And he says, I want you to know that, uh, well, that uh, I love him. I love him like a son. 
There's a judge living at Ramsey Park before me yesterday. Sunday. I said, as a matter of fact, he lived with us. Alicia and I lived with him. And, and uh, at the same time, there was another guy by the name of Frank Serpico in the house there. Mm -hmm. You remember Frank Serpico? Oh, yeah. Remember that case? Well, that was a wild one. If you haven't, check it out. Serpico with Al Pacino. But uh, corruption in the uh, drug, the drug division in New York City. Oh, geez, surprise, eh? But uh, so here we are, and he says, "Well, he says, he says, you know, as a matter of fact, we've been on a number of fronts together. We've struggled together, and Dr. Julia Spring in the Sky has never stopped fighting for the common good of the people. We're both involved in the anti-war together. He lived with me for five months with with Alicia and his kids." And she said, and, and on top of that, Your Honor, you never asked me for money. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, I said, geez, man, that's why you love me, brother? <laughs> I never asked you for money? Anyways, that was just a little thing. But he actually said that, you know? But he said, he said it in a real nice way. Okay, anyways, the conclusion on that was the judge didn't care. The judge said, the judge said, <clears throat> I'll wait all the evidence, all the testimony. And then he said, he came back with his decision. He gave me two years. He convicted me two years for obstructing justice. <laughs> he said, because he said, you know what? He said, I'm not convicting you because of what you believe. I said, I truly believe you believe what you believe. And I have no problem with that. You're entitled with that. He said, but it's the way you want about it. He said, because by looking at all this tape, he said, if you really had just turned around and told 700 people to invade that building, they would have went. Because it seems like you have that ability to do that if you decide that's what you want to do. But again, you did show a lot of restraint by just holding up a bag of papers and doing it by yourself. So I give you that much. And your attorney has asked for a conditional discharge, which in fact was what I got. A year's probation, a $1,000 fine. And if I don't get in charge, charge and within a year, right, the two years will get dismissed, right? I'll be on probation and that thousand dollar fine to a charity of my choice. I happen to send that thousand dollars, by the way, to uh, the architects and engineers for 9/11 Truth. You know who they are? Anybody know who they are? Well, they're 1,500 scholars right now that are basically saying the whole story about the planes being the sole reason the towers coming down was a bunch of BS. And in reality, in reality, it was explosives that brought them towers down. And they've unequivocally proved it. As a matter of fact, they were just here a couple of days ago, and then they went to Toronto to show the film on that. So with that, I'm going to say that uh, <clears throat> George Bush is coming to British Columbia, Surrey, British Columbia, and on October 20th, this change is coming to Vancouver on September 26th, and we will be there to unwelcome them again. <laughs> By the in conclusion, my friends, in conclusion, for the moment, before we have a Q&A, let's have a break. Go look at my book, take a good break, think about what I've said so far, then we'll have a Q&A. And then maybe somebody will buy me a Pepsi, uh, not that I'm promoting a brand name, but, uh, <laughs> but I just happen to like it this time of night. It puts me to sleep, I think. <laughs> Anyways, but the last thing I want to say at the moment here is that <clears throat> we have a duty. If you read, when you read in my book, you're going to see the autobiography of Spring in the Sky from Attica to the South Pacific Lake, and then you're going to see this little subtitle. It's called Unmasking the Psychosexual Energies in the 21st Century. And you're going to say to yourself, what the hell is that in there for? And I'm going to say to you, there's just this. I want to throw in a footnote. When I was in jail, when I was in jail and I was reading, I started reading voraciously because Sam Melville, man, basically told me, look, start putting that good mind to you, start reading. <clears throat> One of the books I read was a book called uh, George Jackson's Letters from Prisons. Now he said to his mother, he says, he said, Mom, he said, the next time you catch Jonathan pleasuring himself, don't you dare stop him. I said, whoa. What the heck is this? Because uh, 
as you sus I guess you would suspect, I mean, prisoners probably indulge that form of activity. It's probably the only thing that they do. Now, I'm not saying it to be gross. I'm saying it that there's a real reason. I said, well, why is he saying this? Then he says, I want you to go out and buy a book called The Mass Psychology of Fascism by Wilhelm Reich and make him read it. Make him read it and you read it. I said, what? I said, what is that? Then I said, oh, geez, I got to get that book. I got to get that book. So I don't know who was representing me there. I've had so many lawyers. I said, hey, man, do me a favor. Go out and buy this book for me. So I read the book cover to cover. And then I found out that this guy by the name of Wilhelm Reich 